Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Henry Weil share his firsthand account of the Holocaust with us today. Henry, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, thank you to the entire audience for allowing me to join you today. I am honored and privileged to be able to do so. It is so important for us to continue to talk about the Holocaust and the horrors that so many of us experienced. Well, Henry, thank you again uh, for joining us today. We have a, a lot for you to cover, so we'll, we'll go ahead and move into it, Henry. You were born in Vienna, Austria on September 22nd, 1935, almost three years before Hitler, or excuse me, almost three years after Hitler came to power in neighboring Germany. Please tell us about your parents, Hugo and Mariska, and what you know of their life in Austria in the early 1930s. Yes. We lived in Vienna, Austria, in what is known as the Ninth District, which was a very nice uh, part of the city. Uh, we were very comfortable living there. There's a photograph of my father and my mother. And as you can see, they're nicely dressed. We weren't wealthy, but we were comfortable. Uh, we, we had a very, very nice life. We had an extended family. I had uh, aunts and uncles there and cousins, and we were together very, very frequently, usually on weekends when we all got together for various uh, activities. And it was a very, very nice life. We were very happy living in Vienna until March of 1938 when the Anschluss occurred. That is the occupation of Austria by and, the Nazis. And Henry, before we move on to, to the Anschluss, a few more questions of you. Neither of your parents were from Vienna. How did they end up in Vienna and how'd they meet? Well, my mother was born in Budapest, Hungary, and my father in Prague in Czech, what was then Czechoslovakia. Uh, their uh, families moved them to Vienna early on, maybe in the early 20s. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the reason was, but I assume that there were living conditions in those areas where they were living were, were not good for Jews and they thought that they would have a much better life in Vienna, which they did. My father worked uh, for his uncle in a store where they sold leather goods and jewelry. And there's a photograph of uh, Philip Weil's store. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the store where my father worked and that is his uncle, Philip. And so it was a very nice life, as I said before. Thank you. And you, you were born 10 years after your parents were married and you were very close to your cousins who lived nearby. Tell us, what you remember about, you know, the time you had with your cousins and your extended family from that era. Sure. My mother's sisters uh, uh, had two daughters, uh, Mary and Ilsa. They lived not too far from where we were in Vienna. And my mother's brother, uh, Ernest, and my uncle Ernie had two children, Anne and Tom. And on weekends, often we were together playing either at my uh, apartment house or in the park nearby or their, their, uh, in their neighborhoods. And so we were very, very close and really enjoyed our lives in, in Vienna. Was your family religiously observant? When, uh, yeah, observant, yes. I mean, they were not uh, what is known uh, to, uh, as ultra-Orthodox, but they, were, uh, they, they believed very, very strongly in their religion, attended synagogues on a regular basis, yes. And, and before we move on to continue the discussion about the Anschluss, tell us what you remember or you know from your parents about the neighborhood where you lived uh, prior to the Anschluss. It was, as I said, very nice neighborhood. Uh, this is a photograph of a park nearby. Uh, uh, you can see uh, my picture there, dressed very nicely. And um, the neighborhood was very, very nice. It was, uh, it was also interesting that uh, a very famous uh, psychoanalyst by the name of Sigmund Freud, who I'm sure you've heard of, uh, lived about a block away. And uh, as it were, uh, my father uh, would play cards with Sigmund Freud. And once uh, my father told me years later that uh, some of his friends who were you know, participating in those card games thought that Sigmund Freud was crazy. Uh, that's what they said. No. <laughs> in March 1938, Nazi Germany um, annexed Austria, in which we took know as the Anschluss, and you mentioned it, 
a few moments ago. When German troops crossed the border into Austria on March 12th, they received enthusiastic support from most of the country's population. We have some film footage of Vienna from around the time of the Anschluss that we're going to show. We see Nazi flags hanging throughout the city. It looks celebratory. You can see that some of the crowd is enthusiastic. And here we see footage from a parade with soldiers marching through the streets. Although you were very young, Henry, just two and a half at that time, tell us what you can about the Anschluss. What I remember as a young child uh, is this. Um, first of all, let me just uh, say that the Anschluss uh, occurred with, it, it took place maybe within a day or two with no resistance whatsoever. The Austrians were very, very happy to have the, uh, the German, uh, the Third Reich coming in. And um, it, it just, uh, it, it was just amazing how quickly that went. It may have been in part due to the fact that Adolf Hitler himself was, was born in Austria. Mm -hmm. But what I do remember is being in my apartment one day and uh, when I heard drums beating and I heard soldiers marching and I went over to the window and I looked out and there were the German troops were marching directly in front of my apartment house. I thought it was kind of fun. I thought it was a parade. And, but my mother, on the other hand, was just absolutely hysterical. And that's when my parents, I believe, decided that things were not getting any better. They were only getting worse day by day, and it was time to make arrangements to try to get the necessary documentation to be able to escape the horrors which were to follow. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, to talk a little bit about that, if you could, immediately following the Anschluss, anti-Semitic policies resulted in restrictions being imposed upon Jews, as well as public humiliation and anti-Semitic violence. What, what can you tell us about some of those restrictions and these threats that were occurring to daily life for Jews in Austria and Vienna at that time. Life changed drastically from what it was before the Anschluss uh, to where we were restricted. We, we could not go to the playgrounds. We were not allowed to go to the parks. Uh, as I understand it, uh, that I didn't go to the movie theaters, but I do recall my parents telling me that that was uh, no longer permitted. So there were many, many restrictions and things just got worse, it seems, day by day by day. And uh, my parents felt that it was just absolutely essential to try to escape. At, at that time, Henry, one of your cousins that you grew up with was a little older than you and took on an important task for the family. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I had a cousin, Mary, who was a few years older than I. Uh, she was the daughter of my Aunt Hilda and my Uncle Sam. They lived not too far. And uh, because she had blonde hair and blue eyes, uh, she, was, she was chosen by the family to go out at night and buy whatever groceries she could and bring them home for the, for the extended family. And she was just absolutely petrified. She told me many years later, as a matter of fact, many years later when she arrived in America, uh, she converted. She And I said to her once, Mary, why did you do that? She said, I was just so petrified walking down the streets and having those Germans looking at me and staring at me. I just never wanted to go through that again. I never wanted to be Jewish again. By the way, my cousin Mary uh, was sent by her parents to England uh, to live out the war. My, her younger sister, Ilsa, was part of the, what is known as the Kinder Transport, mm -hmm. also sent to England. They were re reunited with their parents once the war was over. Henry, we have here a photograph that shows uh, Jews being forced to scrub pavement in Vienna soon after the Anschluss. Tell us what really stands out for you in this photograph. Well, as you can see, the people seem to be very happy in doing whatever destruction they could do. Uh, as I recall, my parents telling me that the people, the, well, they were just, just horrible. And, and what's, so, what's so sad is you see people, the bystanders, with smiles on their face, mm -hmm. just uh, delighted on what they're watching. It was just yeah. so shocking. And that's uh, unfortunately true today when, when people see uh, horrific things being done. They, they are innocent bystanders and they don't do anything or say anything. Very, very sad to see.
a very powerful photo for the reasons you just described. Because of your age, you were just two and a half years old at the time. Did you have any sense of the dangers to your family? And how did your parents try to protect you from the dangers that were around you? My parents did protect me. I was too young to really appreciate the, the dangers and the horrors of what was going on all, all around me. And so my parents uh, shielded me from all of that. And they continued to do so even after we came to America. And I really wasn't uh, provided with any real significant information until I was a little older in middle school and high school before my parents really started to talk, uh, talk to me about uh, what, the, what, was, what, what had happened. So the answer is uh, they did They did shield me. Thank they you. They did shield you, yeah. Henry, um, the Jewish community in Vienna recognized the dangers that they were facing, and many scrambled to leave and find safe haven. In the year and a half after the Anschluss, more than 100,000 people managed to flee Vienna. So many families were trying to emigrate at the same time that it prompted a global refugees crisis. The immigration process to the United States in the late 1930s was complicated, requiring individuals to acquire large amounts of paperwork. Among other things, visa applicants had to get affidavits. Will you explain to us what an affidavit was and tell us about your father's efforts to try to secure one for your family so that you could leave? Sure, my father would go every day to the consulate, to the American consulate, to try to obtain the necessary documentation that was required to be able to leave uh, Austria. One document in particular that was required was an affidavit of support. Now, there was a gentleman in Boston, we, did, we didn't know anybody that would, would provide us with such an affidavit, but there was a gentleman in Boston whose name is Mr. Rice. There's a, a photograph of the affidavit on the screen. Mr. Rice, who didn't know us, we did not know him, provided this affidavit of financial support for my family. You can see uh, there about midway down, uh, Mr. Rice was earning at that time $26 a week. Now $26 a week by today's economy would be somewhat more, but still not, not, not a lot of money. And here a man who out of the goodness of his heart provided such an affidavit. If it wasn't for Mr. Rice, I wouldn't be sitting here today talking with you. And what's interesting is, is that Mr. Rice, uh, I don't know how this affidavit even came into being because he didn't know us. As I said, I can only assume that maybe he provided such an affidavit for other families as well by sending blank affidavits uh, to the American consulate and having them fill out the names. I, I just don't know because it were very, very small quotas and we were a, a group of lucky ones who were able to get those documents, including this affidavit of support. And, and from this affidavit document, we can see that Mr. Rice was, as you said, he, was, he earned $26 a week. He was 27. He was married and had a one-year-old child. And he lists the reason why your father wanted to come to the United States as, quote, the German government's attitude towards the Jewish people in Germany, end quote. He, and he was also, uh, Mr. Rice was also in the leather industry uh, and um, this is occupation is that in, um, in New York. But tell us your thoughts about, you know, what he wrote there about um, that, the reason for your leaving. Well, obviously, Mr. Rice is correct. I mean, the, the reason for our wanting to leave was the persecution of the Jewish people in Austria. And um, it's interesting. Uh, we... We, we, we didn't really, well, my mother had a brother, my uncle Joe, who had come to America uh, several years after the end of, first, uh, of the First World War. And he was already living in New York. That may have been the compelling reason for my, why my parents selected America uh, as, their, uh, as their first choice. And thank God, I, I'm so happy that they did. I'm delighted and I'm very happy that they selected America. I'm happy, had a nice life here. But um, other than that, I, I just don't, uh, I, I don't know what, uh, what, what prompted them because there's so many survivors here at the Holocaust Museum who tell me that they just got on a boat. They didn't know where they were going. Some of them wound up in, in Shanghai and in South America. And some, I met a gentleman in Aruba one day who was from Berlin. I mean, it was just, uh, 
you, you did what you had to do to get wherever away. you could get a place to would willing exactly. to take you and and your your father was successful he was able to get this affidavit uh, and then get a visa to travel to the united states but then then there's a problem with the visa tell us about this yeah there was a hitch my father after weeks and months went by gets the affidavit and when he looks at uh, looks at the documents it it's only ha it, it only has his name it doesn't have my mother's name doesn't have my name so my father goes back, gets on lines again, goes through the essentially the, the process from the beginning until he's uh, able to convince whoever was uh, handling these uh, matters to include my mother's name and my name. They had originally told him, uh, Hugo, you're, you're the only name that is required. Your wife and your, your son will be uh, able to travel with you. But my father, thank goodness, was very detail oriented and he didn't accept that. So he finally got that. That, that, that caused further delay. I think as your father described it to you, the way you described it to me, your father said it was a nightmare, the whole process, uh, making those arrangements. So what can you tell us about what you remember or know of the length of time it took from when your father and mother decided to take action and you were finally able to get uh, the affidavit and the visas? I'm not exactly sure of when they put this uh, process into motion, but I, I, I assume somehow I connected with my having observed these German troops marching in front of our apartment building. And I don't know exactly when that was, whether it was uh, closer to the Anschluss or closer to Kristallnacht, which is the night of the broken glass, which happened in November of 1930. I'm not exactly sure when the process started, but what I do know is it took not only days and weeks, but months because from the beginning, we didn't, we didn't leave uh, Austria until uh, very uh, late uh, August or the first week of September of 1939, which was just days before World War II started in Europe. Right. So I think altogether, the way you've described it, I think it's, it took about 18 months, so it's almost a exactly. year and a half. And so after a year and a half of trying to leave Vienna in August 1939, as you just said, um, your family, but before they were able to leave, you were forced out of your apartment. Tell us about, about that incident and, and how the family was able to find shelter. Here you were so close to trying to, to leave uh, Vienna. Sure. When, when my father finally was able to obtain the necessary documentation and the affidavit from Mr. Rice, we were uh, told that we would be heading to Southampton, England, where there would be a ship waiting to bring us to America. We were put out of our apartment uh, within the first few days of September or the last couple of days of August. I'm not sure exactly, but uh, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't leave the city for whatever reason, I'm not sure. Fortunately, my father had a friend that he had uh, made a uh, number of years before who was now actually a German soldier. And he, this, this uh, friend, offered to allow my mother, my father, and myself to stay with him and his family in his home for a few days before it was safe for us to leave the city. What, what an act of kindness that was. This is a man that took, uh, took us in at great risk, not only to himself, but to his entire family, if he had been caught doing this. And at but the ultimately, time he was a member of the German army? I'm sorry? And at the time he was a member of the German army doing that? Yes, he was a member of the German army. But he, he was a friend of my father's and he he took pity on us. And when, when you got through that and were able to finally leave um, besides each other, what, what did your family take with you when you left Vienna? Very little. Essentially, the clothes on our back. But there is an inventory uh, document uh, that's being uh, shown on the screen. I think it shows my father's. Uh, my father was a big opera, uh, opera buff and it shows my father's uh, Opera, above, uh, opera glasses, it shows my mother's um, iron, and I think uh, some few dollars, maybe 10 or $20 in, 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 in currency. But other than that, that was it. That was the, uh, that was the inventory that was- That was it, provided. all that you had with you. Uh, well, what, what can you tell us about um, actually leaving Vienna now that you were able to do it uh, with the affidavit and the visas and you're on your way. How did you how did you leave? What do you remember of it? Once we were released to leave, we had to travel on our way to Southampton through Paris, France. When we arrived in Paris, we were met with air raids. 
every night. We were there for almost a week. I don't remember the exact length of time, but it was close to a week. And we spent most of that time every night in an air raid shelter. One of the things that I do remember is my father was, uh, had picked me up to run to the shelter. And on the way, he lost one of his shoes. Didn't stop to pick up his shoe, just kept running and uh, went uh, with me and my mother to the air raid shelter. Many nights when we were headed to the air raid shelter, the air raid shelter was already full, the, the certain, you know, filter capacity, and we were not allowed to enter. So we had to ride in the metro all night, waiting until the air raids would stop. And this went on, as I say, for several days, close to approximately a week, which caused further delay. Where did you go from Paris? And what do you know about that part of your journey? Once we were able to leave Paris, as I said, we were headed to Southampton, England. Uh, we, we, our first uh, uh, place of uh, where we first stopped was in La Havre, France, which was on the channel, on the uh, English Channel. We crossed the English Channel, arrived in Southampton, and um, lo and behold, uh, the ship that we had been told would be bringing us to America had already left port because of the long delays that my father encountered in obtaining the necessary documentation and the further delay in being held up in Paris and the air raid shelters, the ship had already left. We had no idea what was going to happen with us. Fortunately uh, for us, that ship that we were scheduled to depart on was sunk by German U-boats, sunk by German U-boats. So just by, now, just by the fortune of delay, uh, you missed that. The delay, we, our lives were saved on two different, in two different aspects, mm -hmm. leaving Austria and missing that ship. Fortunately, there was another ship that we were placed on, the Aquitania, and uh, we were able to come to America on the Aquitania. So here you are on the Aquitania. Um, fortunately, um, uh, the ship uh, is uh, the one that left after the U-boat got the one that you were supposed to have been on. Uh, but your your dangers from U-boats were not for, uh, were not over for you. Tell us about that, and then about your journey to New York itself. That is a an article that appeared in the New York Daily Mirror. And I believe the date is uh, September the 17th, 1939. We arrived in New York Harbor uh, the day before on September the 16th, 1939. And about midway down on the right is a photograph of three boys wearing life vests. That's me in the middle. And the other boys are the Weiner brothers from Germany. And what's so interesting is, is that we are required to wear those life vests for the entire journey. We had to sleep in those life vests because we were being chased by German U-boats, such as those, such as the U-boats that had torpedoed the, the ship that we were originally scheduled to depart on. And um, there's another there's another photograph on that uh, page of a ladder that was placed on the deck with a with a with a notification in case of a torpedo this way out, which we were told was if we were being struck by a torpedo, we were to ascend that ladder to a higher deck, which would put us in a, a safer place. Uh, fortunately, that was not required. Uh, we were able to zigzag across the Atlantic. Uh, it took, uh, I, I think we left on the uh, 2nd or 3rd of September, and I think we arrived on the ninth, on the uh, 16th of, we, we left on the 9th of September, and we arrived on the uh, 16th of September. So it was about a week, the journey. The reason it took so long was because we were zigzagging the entire uh, time that we were sailing because we had to try to outmaneuver these uh, U-boats that were chasing us. Did your, but did we did your arrive parents, safely. Did your parents later ever say how terrifying that must have been to know that you were basically being hunted by U-boats and you're out there in the middle of the ocean? They certainly did, and um, they, they also told me that uh, I was obviously oblivious to what was going on. They told me, uh, as I recall, that there was, a, there was a rocking horse, a wooden rocking horse <laughs> on our deck, and they told me that I spent most of my time on the rocking horse, totally oblivious to what was going on. But they were obviously very, very frightened uh, yeah. about that uh, journey. Can, can only imagine. 
Well, tell us about arriving in New York City. Sure. Uh, on September the 16th, 1939, thank God, we arrived in New York Harbor. And you'll see in a moment the photograph of uh, us being on the top deck of the ship. And there's the Statue of Liberty in the background. And everybody is just so happy to be in America. A vague recollection of people screaming, America, America. And what's so interesting is that that uh, Statue of Liberty, uh, which is significant to anyone and all, all Americans, has particular significance to me. And when I'm in New York uh, from time to time, uh, I'm in lower Manhattan, I see the Statue of Liberty. I still become very, very emotional when I see that because it means so much to me to have mm -hmm. seen that. We're taken from the harbor directly over to Ellis Island, which at that time was an immigration center where we had to be processed. As I recall, that was an overnight uh, uh, event. And uh, once we completed that process, we were allowed to enter the United States. Now, as I said earlier, uh, we, we came with essentially nothing. And, uh, but fortunately, my mother's older sister, my Aunt Hilda, she had left Vienna uh, a few months before we did. And she and her husband and family had already settled in New York. So we were able to stay with them for that uh, short period of time until my father could find work. So here you are, just four years old. Uh, your family settled in New York and your parents, uh, your father lands a job and they're able to start to get themselves established. Tell us about that. My, my green card, that's correct. And you'll notice that uh, my name is not Henry, it's Heinz. And uh, anecdotally, I'll tell you that uh, my mother tells me that uh, she went to the supermarket uh, when she arrived here and she saw Heinz uh, products like ketchup, mustard, baked beans. And she told me that that would not be a fitting name for her son. So they started to call me Henry. And uh, that name has stuck with me uh, all these years. I think the real reason probably was that the Heinz is too Germanic and uh, they didn't want to have that uh, name for their son. So, but it was an interesting story any, that, any of that. was a, definitely a plausible one, right? Yeah. Exactly. Was, so uh, saying my father, uh, once we arrived in New York and we're living with aunt and uncle, uh, heard that there was some work in Philadelphia in leather because my father had been in the leather industry in Europe. So he went to Philadelphia to work and he spent the entire week, the weekdays, I should say, in Philadelphia, came back to New York on the weekends. And that went on for some period of time until he found that there was a uh, real robust uh, leather industry in Wilmington, Delaware. And that's where we went. We, we moved, uh, he moved the family to Wilmington, Delaware, which is where I grew up. And what was that? What were those early days like for you making adjustments? You were, you know, as you said, four years old when you arrived. Next year you were in kindergarten. What was it like for you? For me, it was uh, fairly uh, easy and pleasant. I, I started school right away. Uh, I didn't speak any English when I started. Obviously, I only spoke German, but I, I picked it up as a young child much, much quicker than my parents. Uh, and I went all through grammar school in Wilmington. Uh, at that particular time, my parents uh, had to attend night school. They had to learn the English language. They had to learn something about American history that would qualify them uh, to be able to take the exam for American citizenship, which they did. And they were just so delighted to be in America, so, so happy to be in America. I went all through grade school there. I went to junior high, high school, ultimately went to the University of Delaware and graduated from Delaware. It Henry, I was going to ask you during uh, when you arrived in September 1939, of course, the United States would not be in the war until after Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Um, do you remember if during your, that time your family, your parents were in touch with family and friends still uh, back in Austria? Yes, my father had several siblings. One of his sisters was his uh, sister Wilma. And I do recall my father and I was going, uh, I went along with him, would go to the post office with boxes of, of non-perishable goods that he would be sending to his sister Wilma. My father never received any response. We don't know whether he, whether, whether sister Wilma you know, received the, the, the packages or didn't receive the packages, but that didn't uh, deter him. He, he kept on sending those, those packages whenever he could. So uh, that, uh, that, that's what happened during those. And of course, uh, 
uh, later, uh, in, uh, my father received a telegram telling him that his entire family had been killed in the concentration camps. And um, there's another interesting story that I can tell you uh, uh, that many years later, when I was driving a car, my parents never drove a car. We had a, a car in the family, but I was the family driver. And I was driving them through a small community in New Jersey known as Vineland, New Jersey. Vineland, New Jersey uh, happened to have a number of small farms. It was a farming community. And uh, for some reason, uh, some survivors of the Holocaust who were able to escape wound up in Vineland and were operating these farms. And I was driving through, my father saw a sign, fresh eggs for sale. So he asked me to stop the car and I did. And he went into the farmhouse to purchase some eggs. And for some reason it took him a long time. He never, he didn't come out for quite a while. And when he came out, he was really, very, very upset. He was crying. And, and this is a, a remarkable coincidence. The woman who was operating the farm told my father that she was his sister, one of his sister's cellmates in the in a concentration camp and proceeded to tell him that a german guard or an officer or soldier i don't know what his position was in the in the camp gave my father's sister a poison pill to take just before she was to be taken to the gas chamber an, a, an act of uh, i suppose you could call it a, a charitable act mm -hmm. so that she wouldn't die of asphyxiation she would have a more peaceful death um, Henry, I, I just really have one more question for you today. Um, as we face rising anti-Semitism, related conspiracy theories, and Holocaust denial, please tell us what we can and should learn from you, from what you experienced, you and your family, during the Holocaust. I um, have really not had too much, uh, I mean, I have not any, can't recall but maybe two instances of anti-Semitism that were directed at me. And let me tell you briefly what they were. When I first graduated from law school, uh, I applied for a job with an insurance company here in Washington. And I was having an interview with the uh, claims manager. Had a very nice chat. And uh, he says, I'd like to hire you, but I have to make a phone call. I said, sure. And I was sitting right across the table from him. He picks up the phone, calls the main head, uh, headquarters of the company. He says, I'd like to hire this young man. I think he'd do a good job, but he's Jewish. Can I hire him? I was dumbfounded. I was sitting there. This was like in 1950, in 1961 or 62. Uh, I just, he says, good news. I was given permission to hire you. I said, well, thank you very much. And I worked there for a few years. Mm -hmm. The second incident that I personally encountered was when I was a trial lawyer and I was trying a case in suburban Maryland and I had my client on the witness stand. She had been in an accident. She had back injury and I questioned, I put a question to her. Could you please explain the, the degree of pain that you encountered as a result of this uh, accident? And her response was, it was like a Jew sticking a knife in your back and twisting it. This is in front of a jury, a, a judge on jury. My initial reaction was to just pick up my, my papers, my file, and leave the courtroom, but uh, better, better judgment told me not to do that. I, I might be disciplined by the bar, I may even get disbarred. I don't know. You can't just abandon a client. So what I did is I, I approached her after the case was completed. I said, ma'am, can you explain something to me? When someone sticks a knife in your back and twists it, tell me what the difference in the degree of pain is, whether it's a Jew or a non-Jew. Well, I guess she was dumbfounded at that point. She, she didn't respond and I just walked away. But to answer the question, I mean, it, it, it's so, so terrible to see what's happening in this. We never, I, I never dreamed that we would confront any anti-Semitism in, in the United States. And I feel very, very bad uh, for my children and my grandchildren having to live in this atmosphere. It, it's, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. Uh, it's so, so sad. Uh, what I would say is, um, you know, and I would just add before I go on is we have some of the survivors here who were in the concentration camps who endured horrific, horrific times in those camps. For them to be here and have survived that and now having to confront anti-Semitism at the present time in this country 
it's just unimaginable how they how they must feel. Well, Henry, we are just so grateful to you for your willingness to be our first person to spend this time with us, share the experience that you went through, your parents went through, and of course, um, the rest of your extended family. So um, thank you for spending time as our first person today. Thank you very much.